Hello, my darlings. Madam Raven here. And today I bring you Viking Werewolves. No, I am not kidding. This is chapter three of Sabine Bearing Gold's werewolf book. And uh, it's entitled Werewolf in the North. In Norway and Iceland, certain men were said to be Egi Einhammer, not of one skin, an idea which had its roots in paganism. The full form of this strange superstition was that men could take upon them other bodies, and the natures of those beings whose bodies they assumed. The second adopted shape was called by the same name as the original shape, Hammer, an expression made use of to designate the transition from one body to another was skipta homon or at hamon while the expedition made in the second form was the hamfor by this transfiguration extraordinary powers were acquired the natural strength of the individual was doubled or quadrupled he acquired the strength of the beast in whose body he traveled in addition to his own and a man thus invigorated was called Hamramor. The manner in which the change was effected varied. At times, the dress of skin was cast over the body, and at once the transformation was complete. At others, the human body was deserted and the soul entered the second form, leaving the first body in a cataleptic state, to all appearances dead. The second hammer was either borrowed or created for the purpose. Yet there is a third manner of producing this effect. It was by incantation. But then the form of the individual remained unaltered. Through the eyes of all beholders were charmed so that they could only perceive him under the selected form. Having assumed some bestial shape, the man who is Ege Einhammer is only to be recognized by his eyes, which by no power can be changed. He then pursues his course, follows the instinct of the beast whose body he has taken, yet without quenching his own intelligence. He is able to do what the body of the animal can do, and do what he as a man can do as well. He may fly or swim, he may fly or swim if B is in the shape of the bird or fish. If he has taken the form of a wolf, or if he goes on a gandred or wolf's ride, he is full of the rage and malignity of the creatures whose power and passion he has assumed. I will give a few instances of each of the three methods of changing bodies mentioned above. Freya and Frigg had their falcon dresses in which they visited different regions of Earth, and Loki is said to have borrowed these and to have then appeared so precisely like a falcon that he would have escaped detection but for the malicious twinkle of his eye. Belinda Kvida is the following passage. I'm giving you the translation. I am not attempting the old Norsk. From the south flew the maidens, all toward the gloom, all vit the young, to fix destinies. They on the seed strand sat them to rest. These damsels of the south, fair linen spun, one of them took Egil to press, fair maid in her dazzling arms. Another was Svanvit, who wore swan feathers, and the third, their sister pressed the white neck. Thank you for closing down on me. Pressed the white neck of Volund. The introduction of Samun tells us that these charming young ladies were caught when they laid their swan skins beside them on the shore and were consequently not in a condition to fly. In like manner were wolves' dresses used. The following curious passage is from the wild saga of the wolf songs. It is now to be told that Sigmund thought 
seemed for the earth too young to help him in his revenge, and his wished first to test his power. So during the summer they plunged deep into the wood and slew men for their goods, and Sigmund saw that he was quite of the Volsung stock. Now it fell out that they went through the forest, collecting monies, that they lighted on a house, in which two men sleeping, with great gold rings on them, they had dealings with witchcraft, for wolf skins hung up in the house above them. It was the tenth day on which they might come out of their second skins. They were king's sons, Sigmund and Singfjordli, got into the habits and could not get out of them again, and the nature of the original beasts came over them, and they howled as wolves. They learned both of them to howl. Now they went into the forest, and each took his own course. They made the agreement together that they should try their strength against as many as seven men, but not more, and that he who was aware of strife should utter his wolf's howl. Do not fail in this, said Sigmund, for you are young and daring, and men would be glad to chase you. Now each went his own course, and after that they had parted, Sigmund found men. So he howled, and when Sinfjord heard that he ran up and slew them all, then they separated, and Sinfjord the had not long been in the wood before he met with eleven men. He fell upon them and slew ev them every one. Then he was tired, so he flung himself under an oak to rest. Up came Sigmund and said, Why did you not call out? Sinfjordli replied, What was the need of asking your help to kill eleven men? Sigmund flew at him and rent him so that he fell, for he had bitten through his throat. That day they could not leave their wolf forms. Sigmund laid him on his back and bare him home to the hall, and sat beside him and said, Deuce take the wolf forms. From the Volsung Saga, C8. There is another curious story of a werewolf in the same saga which I must relate. Now he did as she requested, and hewn down a great piece of timber, and cast it across the feet of those ten brothers seated in a row in the forest. And there they sat all that day, and on till night. And at midnight there came an old she-wolf out of the forest to them, as they sat in the stocks, and she was both huge and grimly. Now she fell upon one of them and bit him to death, and after she had eaten him all up, she went away. The next morning Signy set a trusty man to her brothers to know how it had fared with them. When he returned and told her of the death of one, and that grieved her much, for she feared it might fare thus with all of them, and she would be unable to assist them. In short, nine nights following came the same she-wolf at midnight, and devoured them one after another until all were dead, except Sigmund, and he was left alone. So when the tenth night came, Signy sent her trusted men to Sigmund, her brother, with honey in his hands, and said he was to smear it over the face of Sigmund, and to fill his mouth with it. Now he went to Sigmund and did as he was bid, after which he returned home. And during the night came the same she-wolf, as was her wont, and reckoned to devour him like his brothers. Now she snuffled at him where the honey was smeared, and began to lick his face with her tongue, and presently thrust her tongue into his mouth. He bore it ill and bit into the tongue of the she-wolf. She sprang up and tried to break loose, setting her feet against the stalk so as to snap it asunder. But he held firm and ripped the tongue out by the roots, so that it was the death of the wolf. It is the opinion of some men that this beast was the mother of King 
Sigir, and that she had taken this form upon her through devilry and witchcraft. There is another story bearing on the subject of in the Hrolf saga Kraka, which is pretty. It is as follows. In the north of Norway, in upland dales, reigned a king called Hring, and he had a son named Bjorn. Now it fell out that the queen died, much lamented by the king and by all. The people advised him to marry again, and so be sent men south to get him a wife. A gale and fierce storm fell upon them, so that they had to turn the helm and run before the wind. And so they came north to Finnmark, where they spent the winter. One day they went inland and came to the house in which sat two beautiful women, who greeted them well and inquired whence they had come. They replied by giving an account of their journey and their errand and then asked the women who they were, and why they were alone and far from the haunts of men, although they were so comely and engaging. The elder replied that her name was Ingeborg, and her daughter was called Hit, and that she was the Finn King's sweetheart. The messengers decided that they would return home, if Hit would come with them and marry King Thring. She agreed, and they took her with them, and met the king who was pleased with her, and had his wedding feast made, and said that he cared not, though she was not rich, but the king was very old, and that the queen soon found out. There was a carl who had a farm not far from the king's dwelling. He had a wife and a daughter, who was but a child, and her name was Bira, but she was very young and lovely. Bjorn, the king's son, and Bera, the carl's daughter, were wont as children to play together, and they loved each other well. The carl was well-to-do. He had been out harrying in his young days, and he was a doughty champion. Bjorn and Bera loved each other more and more, and they were often together. Time passed, and nothing worth relating occurred. But Bjorn, the king's son, waxed strong and tall, and he was well skilled in all manly exercises. King Huring was often absent for long harrying foreign shores, and Hviet remained at home and governed the land. She was not liked of the people. She was always very pleasant with Bjorn, but he cared little for her. It fell out once that the king Hring went abroad and he spake with his queen that Bjorn should remain at home with her to assist in the government, for he thought it advisable. The queen, being haughty and inflated with pride, the king told his son Bjorn that he was to remain at home and rule the land with the queen. Bjorn replied that he disliked the plan and that he had no love for the queen, but the king was inflexible and left the land with great following. Bjorn walked home after his conversation with the king, and went up to his place, ill-pleased and red as blood. The queen came to speak with him, and to cheer him, and spake friendly with him, but he bade her be off. She obeyed him that time. She often came to talk with him, and said how much pleasanter it was for them to be together than to have an old fellow like Hring in the house. Bjorn resented this speech, and struck her a box in the ear and bade her depart, and he spurned her from him. She replied that this was ill done to drive, and thrust her away, and you think it better, Bjorn, to sweetheart a carl's daughter, than to have my love and favor, a fine piece of condescension and disgrace it is to you. But... Before long, something will stand in the way of your fancy and your folly. Then she struck at him with a wolfskin glove and said that he should become a rabbit and grim wild bear. And you shall eat nothing but your father's sheep, which you shall slay for your food, and never shall you leave this state. After that, Bjorn disappeared. 
and none knew what had become of him. And men sought, but found him not, as was to be expected. Now we must relate how that the king's sheep were slaughtered, half a score at a time, and it was all the work of a gray bear, both huge and grimly. One evening it chanced that the carl's daughter saw this savage bear coming towards her, looking tenderly at her, and she fancied that she recognized the eyes of Bjorn, the king's son. So she made a slight attempt. So she made a slight attempt to escape. Then the beast retreated, but she followed it till she came to a cave. Now when she entered the cave, there stood before her a man who greeted Bera, the Carl's daughter, and she recognized him, for it was Bjorn, her ring son. Overjoyed they were, they to meet. So they were together in the cave a while, for she would not part from him when she had the chance of being with him. But he said that it was not proper that she should be there by him, for by day he was a beast, and by night a man. Her ring returned from his harrying, and he was told the news, of which had taken place during his absence, how that Bjorn his son had vanished, and also how that a monstrous beast was up the country, and was destroying his flocks. The queen urged the king to have the beast slain, but he delayed a while. One night, as Bera and Bjorn were together, he said to her, Methinks tomorrow will be the day of my death, for they will come out to hunt me down. But for myself I care not, for it is little pleasure to live with this charm upon me, and my only comfort is that we are together, and now our union must be broken. I will give you the ring which is under my left hand. You will see the troop of hunters tomorrow come to seek me, and when I am dead go to the king and ask him to give you what is under the beast's left front leg. He will consent. He spoke to her of many other things, till the bear form stole over him, and he went forth a bear. She followed him and saw that a great body of hunters had come over the mountain ridge and had a number of dogs with them. The bear rushed away from the cavern, but the dogs and the king's man came upon him and there was a desperate struggle. He wearied many men before he was brought to bay and had slain all the dogs. But now they made a ring about him, and he ranged around it, but he could see no means of escape. So he turned to where the king stood, and he seized a man who stood next to him and rent him asunder. Then was the bear so exhausted that he cast himself down flat and at once the men rushed in upon him and slew him. The Carl's daughter saw this, and she went up to the king and said, Sire, wilt thou grant me that which is under the bear's left fore shoulder? The king consented. By this time his men had nearly flayed the bear. Bera went up and plucked away the ring and kept it, but none saw what she took nor had they looked for anything. The king asked her who she was, and she gave a name, but not her true name. The king now went home, and Bera was in his company. The queen was very joyous, and treated her well, and asked who she was. But Bera answered as before. The queen now made a great feast, and had the bear's flesh cooked for the banquet. The carl's daughter was in the bower of the queen, and could not escape, for the queen had suspicion who she was. Then she came to Bera with a dish, quite unexpectedly, and on it was a bear's flesh, and she bade Bera eat it. She would not do so. Here is a marvel, said the queen. You reject the offer which a queen herself deigns to make to you? Take it at once, or something worse will befall you. She bit before her and ate of that bite. The queen cut another piece and looked into her mouth. 
she saw that one little grain of the bite had gone down. But Barris spat out the rest from her mouth and said she would take no more, though she was tortured or killed. Maybe you've had sufficient, said the queen, and she laughed. Rolf Saga, Kraka. 24, 27 condensed. Whatever. In the Faroese song of Finur, Hin fi Fidi, Fidi. In the Faroese song of Finur, Hin Fidi, we have the following verse. When this peril Finn saw, that witchcraft did him harm. Then he changed himself into a werewolf. He slew many thus. The following is from the second Kvida of Helga Hundringspana. That's quite the name. May the blade bite which thou brandishest only on thyself. When it chimes on thy head, then avenged will be the death of Helgi. When thou, as a wolf, wanderest in the woods, knowing none fortune nor any pleasure, paying no meat, save riving of corpses. In all these cases, the change is of the form. Now we shall come to the instances in which the person who has changed has a double shape, and the soul animates one after the other. In Yinglinger's saga, says of Odin that he changed forms. The bodies lay as though sleeping or dead, but he was a bird or beast, a fish or a woman, and went in twinklings to far distant lands, doing his own or other people's business. In like manner, the Danish king Harold sent a warlock to Iceland in the form of a whale, whilst his body lay stiff and stark at home. The already quoted saga of Rolf Krake gives another example where Bodvar Bjarki, in the shape of a huge bear, fights desperately with the enemy, which has surrounded the hall of his king, whilst his human body lies drunkenly beside the embers within. In Vatten's de la Saga, there is a curious account of three Finns who were shut up in a hut for three nights and ordered by Ingemund, a Norwegian chief, to visit Iceland and inform him of the lie of the country, where he was to settle. Their bodies became rigid, and they sent their souls the errand, and their awakening at the end of three days gave an accurate description of the Vatsendel in which Ingemund was eventually able to establish himself. But the saga does not relate whether these fins projected their souls into the bodies of birds or beasts. The third manner of transformation mentioned was that in which the individual was not changed himself, but the eyes of others were bewitched, so that they could not detect him, but only saw him under a certain form. Of these, there are several examples in the saga, as, for instance, in the Hormundur saga, Grey's Sonar, and the Forastbere saga. But I will translate the most curious, which is that of Odd, Catless Son, in the Irbringya saga. Girid housewife in Mafelda sent word to Bolstad that she was aware of the fact that Odd, Catless son, had hewn off Ald's hand. Ald, not Odd. Apparently, it sounds very close, but it is spelled quite differently. Now, when Thorarin and Amkel heard that, they rode from the home with twelve men. They spent the night in Mafelid, and rode on next morning to Holt, and Odd was the only man in the house. Katla sat on the high seat spinning yarn, and she bade Odd sit beside her. Also she bade the women sit each in her place and hold their tongues. For, she said, I shall do all the talking. Now when, now when Arnkel and his company arrived, they walked straight in, 
and when they came into the chamber, Katla greeted Arnkel and asked the news. He replied that there was none, and he inquired after Odd. Katla said that he'd gone to Breidak. We shall ransack the house, though, quoth Arnkel. Be it so, replied Katla, and she ordered a girl to carry a light before them and unlock the different parts of the house. All they saw was Katla spinning yarn off in her distaff. Now they search the house, but find no odd, so they depart. But when they had gone a little from the garth, Arnkel stood still and said, How know we but that Katla had hoodwinked us, and that the distaff in her hand was nothing more than odd? Not possible, said Thorn and Rin. Let us turn back, and so they did. And when those at Holt saw that they were returning, Katla said to her maids, Sit still in your places, Odd and I shall go out. Now as they approached the door, she went on to the porch and began to comb and clip the hair of her son Odd. Arnkel came to the door and saw where Carla was, but she seemed to be stroking a goat and disentangling its mane and beard and smoothing its wool. So he and his men went into the house, but found not Odd. Katla's distaff lay against the bench, so they thought it could not have been odd, and they went away. However, when they had come near the spot where they had turned before, Arnkel, Arnkel said, Think you not that odd might have been in the form of a goat? There is no saying, replied Thornarin, but if we turn back, we will lay hands on Katla. We can try our luck again, quoth Arnlek and see what comes of it. So they returned. Now, when they were seen on their way back, Katla bade Odd follow her, and she led him to an ash heap and told him to lie there and to not stir on any account. But when Arnkel and his men came to the farm, they rushed into the chamber and saw Katla seated in her place, spinning. She greeted them and said that their visits followed with rapidity. Arnkel replied that what she said was true. His comrades took the distaff and cut it in twain. Come now, said Katla, you cannot say when you get home that you have done nothing, for you have chopped up my distaff. Then Arnkel and the rest hunted high and low for odd, but could not find him. Indeed, they saw nothing living about the place besides a boar pig, which lay under the ash heap. So they went away once more. Well, when they got halfway to Mafaldid, came Garret to meet them with her workmen. They had not gone the right way to work in seeking aught, she said, but she would help them. So they turned back again. Garret had a blue cloak on her. Now when the party was seen and reported to Katla, it was said that there were thirteen in the number, and one had a colored dress on. Katla exclaimed, That troll Garrett is coming. I shall not be able to throw a glamour over their eyes any more. She started up from her place and lifted the cushion of the seat, and there was a hole and a cavity beneath, and into this she thrust Odd, clapping the cushion over him, and sat down, saying she felt sick at heart. Now when they came into the room, there were small greetings. Gerid cast her of her cloak and went up to Katla, and took the sealskin bag which she had in her hand, and drew it over the head of Katla. Then Gerid bade them break up the seat. They did so, and found Odd. Him they took and carried to Bulen's head, where they hanged him. But Katla they stoned to death under the headland. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, my dear. There was actually a few typos that caused me a bit of a problem. But I think you can see there are many parallels in many other cultures and um, I would say belief systems, but that's not the word I'm looking for. I think the fantasies that's come down to us 
Tolkien and all the rest. Um, Lady Hawk, definitely. Um, if you've never seen that 80s classic, it's a good one. If you can deal with the electronic music, it's not bad. It's just very 80s. <laughs> so close, this raven.